Hey y'all, and welcome to Familypreneur, the podcast for family-first entrepreneurs building profitable and progressive businesses. If we haven't met yet, I'm your host, Meg Brunson, and my pronouns are she, her. Before we get started, I want to remind you that this podcast episode isn't gonna change a thing in your business unless you take action. And the best way to follow through is by joining us inside of the Familypreneur Business Accelerator. It's where we work, win, celebrate, and grow together. Head over to familypreneur.co to join us today. All right, let's do this. Hey, hey, familypreneurs. I am so excited to have you joining us again today. Now, if you love your business but hate dealing with email marketing, that is where today's guest Bev Feldman from Your Personal Tech Fairy comes in. Bev helps service-based solopreneurs build seamless automations on ConvertKit so that you can save time, have the energy to help your clients, and increase opportunities to earn money from your business without using icky-feeling marketing techniques. Bev loves geeking out on technology and getting online platforms to fit together like a puzzle so that you can nurture relationships through email while you focus your time and energy on the parts of business that light you up. I love it so much, and I'm so excited to have you with us here today, Bev. I am so excited to be here, Meg. I want to start with a question because you mentioned ConvertKit, so I know that's your platform of choice. As we're talking today, if you're not using ConvertKit, are you going to be able to benefit from this episode? Absolutely. So, I mean, there are a lot of what I talk about can be applied to pretty much any email marketing platform, especially if they allow you to set up um, automations, which... I would say most of them in some way or other do. Sure, sure. Now, can you, let's start with talking a little bit about ConvertKit. Why is that the platform that you chose? Yeah. So it's funny because I have been, since I started this business and I really honed in on ConvertKit, I've been asked this a lot. And for the longest time, I actually didn't have a very good answer other than, well, it's the one I started using a few years ago after seeing a lot of other bloggers at the time talking about it. And which is like not, necessarily the best reason to switch to any platform. But as I've gotten to, as I've spent a lot of time in it, I've realized there's a lot of things I do really like about it. So for one, like they evolve as a platform a lot. So I think they really listen to their users and they've added so many new features over the years based on, from my understanding, what us, us creators, the people who use the platform want to see. So I love that. That has been a big thing. It integrates also really nicely with a lot of other platforms that many online um, entrepreneurs use. So, for example, like for if you are creating courses, you can easily integrate ConvertKit with a lot of the big platforms such as Thinkific. Um, I believe they integrate with Podia, you know, Teachable, a lot of the, the more commonly used ones. And Anything you can do to streamline that process and avoid having to use other platforms to connect the two will just make your life so much simpler. Um, and then finally, I w- you know, I was listening to your episode about on another podcast where you were talking about doing an audit of your tech. And I was like, all right, I'm going to dig into ConvertKit to see where they line up or if they line up with my values. And I was so relieved to say, to see that they definitely had, they'd put out a statement, um, for Black Lives Matter and they give back and they're, they're, you know, as much as any of us who are white and try to be more mindful about this, I think they're, from my perspective, they're, they're taking a very, like I appreciated that they are, it's something that it's on the radar and they're actively trying to work on. So that was another thing that just made me feel good. So that was more recent. It's not why I joined ConvertKit, but I was very relieved to see that. Yeah, and those are reasons why you stayed. Like sometimes that's just the way yeah. it is. You you stumble into something, and you're using it because it's what you know. But then you stay because of those things. And anyone yeah. who's interested, that episode you're talking about, um, that is the Money Marketing and Mission Show with Mia Francis Poulin, and I believe it was episode number three um, where we talked about doing that audit. So if anyone wants to listen to that as well, thanks for bringing that yeah. up. 
oh, of course. Well, I just thought it was such a brilliant idea. And I was like, oh, I should check all the tech to make sure it lines up, not just with that value, but for me as someone who really cares about, you know, environmental sustainability, making sure that I'm using platforms that hopefully aren't doing, I mean, it's hard being in tech and, it, you know, obviously it uses a lot of energy to run any of these platforms, but at least I, I, it gives me kind of a starting point to talk to the platforms to maybe at least get them thinking about these things. Yeah. And the, the whole, with my tech audit, like the piece that if you're not familiar with it, basically I'm looking at where I'm already spending money in my business and determining if that aligns with my values. Like I might not Mm -hmm. be able to make, you know, million dollar contributions to causes and things like that. Right. Cause I'm, I'm a little guy, um, in the world, but because my money is going towards big companies to buy things that I need for my business. Um, if they're spending the money in a way that's aligned with my values, it's almost like I'm still giving back in that way. Oh, I a hundred percent agree. And as a business owner, like a small business owner, and I've been a small business owner for many years, I believe it's so important that we also support not only other small business owners, but ones that align with their values. Mm-hmm. And obviously can be really tricky if you realize when you're using it does not. And then you have to go through all the trouble, not only finding a new platform, but switching things over. But at the end of the day, if, like you said, if you want to feel like you're contributing in a way that feels in alignment with your values, then it's probably worth it. Even if it kind of, it's not that fun in the moment. Oh yeah. And we talked before this episode, I did that. Like I, the platform I was using for all my things, email, landing pages, courses, like all the things was not aligned. And I had to wait, kind of deal with it for a little bit until the right platform came around, which was FG Funnels. And then I moved Mm -hmm. everything. And it was, it took a lot of time and a lot of energy and things were a little wonky for a while. Um, But I pay a lot of money monthly for those services. Mm -hmm. And I want to know that it's supporting the right things. All right. Well, let's shift because I feel like we could talk about the, that stuff forever, but let's shift to talk about email. Um, so well, can you break down like how email automation like fits into our marketing strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you've been in the online business enough or even just as a, as a consumer, chances are you've seen, you know, an, an opt-in form, sometimes called a lead magnet or a freebie. You know, there's all these different terms floating out there. So we all have ways um, or most of us have ways to capture people's email addresses. And there's a couple things to think about. One, I believe that having an email list is super important because that is your information. So unlike social media, where I do think it's important to have an online presence in that way, that you don't own that information. And unfortunately, a lot of these places can choose to just shut you down. So you want to make sure you have a way to reach out to, to your audience. So the when it comes to automations, there's a couple of things. You might not even think about this, but when someone signs up for your email list and they automatically get an email that either, well, says, hi, thanks for signing up, or here's that thing you signed up for. I mean, that's an automation right there. So most of us have done at least some kind of minimal automation when it comes to email marketing. But I like to take it a step further. So for me, one of the biggest things that I think is important is having some sort of welcome sequence or automated email sequence that goes out to new subscribers once they sign up for your list. And that's for a few reasons. One, you know, if, you know, most of your people like us are parents with lots going on in our lives and, you know, things happen like, like pandemics and school shutdowns, (laughs) so our lives are not always predictable. And you just want to know that no matter what you have going on in your life, that you are reaching out to people when they sign up for your list. And and in a way that doesn't feel like you're manually doing it, but that's happening automatically. And it doesn't have to be in a way that feels like, I think people hear email automations and they're like, ooh, like that, that doesn't feel right. Like that feels really inauthentic. But I like to look at it like if you can set up your emails in a way that feels in alignment with how you want to run your business and how you want to show up in the world. So you can send emails that are genuine and built with, from the perspective of wanting to 
create connection, and even inviting people to respond to your emails. Now, obviously, if you choose to respond back to those emails, which I highly recommend you do as much as you can, like obviously you can't automate that process, but it's a nice way to build up that connection. And then from a, you know, a consumer or user perspective, it gives you the opportunity to decide for yourself, is this a good fit? Because you're kind of you know, you're putting yourself out there a little more, letting them know who you are, and people can decide for themselves, oh, yeah, this person really resonates with me, or, yeah, they're sharing great info, but something about them just doesn't resonate with me, and that's fine, too. Like, it's just an opportunity to build that connection a little bit more in a way, I mean, as much as you can through email. (laughs) Yeah, and I feel like, you, I like that you touched on that you might turn people off and that that is okay because not yeah. everybody's going to be your people and you want an email list that's all excited about you. Um, so if they're not your people, let them go and find who their people are, you know? Exactly. And just like you might not be for everyone, you might have people who are interested in working with you that for, for whatever reason aren't a right fit for you. And that's fine too. Like we – Part of having our own businesses is that we can, we should theoretically have the ability and and to the ability and flexibility to make these decisions that feel right to us. Now, would you say, would you say that that's like the most important? Like, if we don't have automation set up, is that the first thing we should do, or is there like something else that's more important than that? That's a really great question. I would think so. My suggestion would be if, especially as you're getting things up and running, to at the very least do that. I would suggest if you already have a bunch of programs or courses, any kind of digital something out there, that you, it's always a good idea to have some sort of automation set up for that. And not just, okay, here's that thing that you signed up for, bye. But like, obviously you wouldn't say that in your email. But like, you know, invite people, remind them. I mean, how many of us have purchased courses and then forgotten about it? Or oh, I purchased that course and now I don't remember quite what it was called or who I purchased it from and I don't have any way to like find it. But if you get like a couple reminder emails, not in an annoying way, but like, oh, you know, here's like kind of tease out like, oh, this is what what you'll learn in this lesson. And it's like, oh yeah, there's that thing I purchased that I was excited to do and then forgot about, you know? (laughs) So, (laughs) which, you know, it happens to all of us. Like we should never feel guilty about that because so many of us have that happen. So, I would think, so for my suggestion would be minimum do welcome sequence if you have nothing else. But if you do have some programs, just kind of do a little audit to make sure to see what happens. Like sign up for your course and see what happens because you may have forgotten what happens when people sign up. And that's a good point too. Like sign up with your email and get the emails that you have scheduled for other people to get and then think about whether that's sufficient right? Like if that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also a good opportunity to check to make sure things are working right. Like I had, I was testing something out on my own account and then I, so I'm getting my welcome sequence probably for like the seventh time. I'm just using different email addresses. And I'm like, why am I getting this at one in the morning? Like it doesn't make any sense. So it's a good reminder for me to check to make sure I have my settings correct Mm because I shouldn't be getting it in the middle of the night. Oh, that's a good point. So do you, and I don't feel like, and here's where I'm not an email pro, right? But I just set mine to run all the time. You don't, do you think that you should set it to only run during business hours? I think it really depends on your business, quite honestly. I made the decision this a few months ago. I decided, because I have a very extensive series of emails that goes out. Like I have at this month, at this point, about four and a half months worth of scheduled emails. For, so whenever someone signs up for my list, they're going to get a, a bunch of emails over time. And I made the decision to turn them off on the weekends only because was, I'm in the business to business space. And I'm like, well, as a business owner, I'm trying to move away from checking my business email on the weekend. And, and that's not to say there's anything wrong if you do. But if I'm trying to, I'm almost trying to like preserve this sense of, oh, we sh- should, you know, the importance of rest. Yeah. <laughs> and therefore I'm like, I'm just going to not send emails on the weekend. So, but it's totally personal preference. Like I do want people, 
in my space as much as possible, I think, to get the emails when they're working. But that's not to say that you can't. Like, it, it's, it really depends. And I think part of that is knowing your audience. Like, I've seen, for example, people who are whose target audience may, are moms. Like, Saturday mornings might be an excellent time for them to get their emails. Because, you know, if you're taking your kids to sports practice, they're like, oh, well, that's a good time to read my email. And you could probably, would you test that out and track, like, your open rates at different times during the week? Yeah, I mean, you certainly could. I have never gone, I have to say, I've never gone that in-depth with my testing. Like, I do track my open and click-through rates, but I'm mostly just then looking at, like, okay, if I tweak this subject line or the, the copy in the body of the email, I haven't, I I like stats, but not so much to then start <laughs> tweaking with the times. <laughs> well, good to know. Good to know. There's strategies yes. out there. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> now, so we talked a little bit about automations. Once they're on your list and they've gotten, whether it's a, a single email welcome or a sequence of welcome emails, um, then what? Can we talk a little bit about like how we keep that list um, active and engaged? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, when, there's a couple ways you could go. If you want to go the automated route, say meaning you know you want to email your list regularly, but you just don't have the time, you don't have the bandwidth to sit down every week and do a live newsletter, you can still do um, pre like automated emails. So that's what I do. So they're, you know, the, we hear this term evergreen. They're not time-based emails. Um, most That's to say most of the emails that go out to my list. It's just a series of emails that are applicable no matter what time of year it is. That being said, if there is something going on, like I recently offered a workshop. And so I did pause those automations for a few days so I could send out a live email, then turn the autom those automations back on. And then I put like within my email template so people could still see the information about my workshop kind of below all their regular, regularly scheduled emails <laughs> that they get. Um, so, and that, I mean, that's another, actually brings up a point that it's something you can do if you do want to go the more automated route, but you know you have something coming up. Or like for me, if I'm on a podcast, I, I want to promote that podcast and not necessarily wait till I create a new email, my automation, but I can almost put, for lack of a better word, I create like an, an ad for it. <laughs> so it shows up at the bottom of all of my emails, regardless of what email they're getting. Interesting. So, and that's, is that something like ConvertKit? allows you to do so it's almost like you edit like a the footer to put like yeah exactly fresh yeah so like there. yeah like a convert kit definitely allows you to i'm sure other platforms do as well that you can kind of edit what's at the bottom like by default you have your address and an unsubscribe button like all of your every platform will have that because i'm not a a, a lawyer i'm not a a lawyer? Yeah. I'm not a, like a law expert, but you know, you do have to have that info there. Otherwise you're breaking the law, but you can add other info in to the bottom if you wanted, in addition to those two things. Interesting. I love that. Now I'm curious. So you say you, you automate these emails. How, how does writing the emails work if, it, if they're automated and evergreen? And are you just constantly adding to that yeah. funnel? Yeah. So basically, it's a, I love that question. So it's like what I, the way I do it is I try to batch write a bunch of emails. So I'm like, all right, this week I'm going to focus on just getting like another month's worth of emails out. And, for, you know, a month's worth of emails can look different to different people. That could be, you know, if you're, if you want your emails to go out every other week, that's two emails that you just sit and write. And then you know, you know, you have to find time maybe once a month to do that. Um, so yeah, I just kind of go through, I have a week or two where, you know, sprinkled in with all the other work I have to do. I'll like sit down for an hour or two. I'm like, all right, I'm going to bang out a couple more emails. Um, and I really, and I mean, things are always changing. I'm, I do like to add in some like podcast interviews into some of those automated emails. Um, so, and then as I learn new things, I add in more tips. So, so it that's how, that's the process I do it. I guess I I'm it. I'm wondering, so you said that your right now your your welcome sequence is like a four month sequence. Yeah. So I have my welcome sequence and then it kind of then feeds into 
so the the welcome emails are a little spa more spaced closely. So maybe they're every other day over a span of a couple weeks, and then they come to my more long term nurture sequence, and then they're like twice a week. Okay, interesting. I just love hearing how other people are leveraging yeah. that platform. Now, what if you are mm -hmm. a person that has a list? And maybe you were good at emailing them before, maybe not. Uh, but now you're like, oh, shoot, I should probably do something with this list. Do you have any tips for like re-engaging a list that may have kind of gone flat because you haven't yeah. emailed them in a few weeks or months or years? Yeah. I mean, you can kind of go one of two ways. You can say, hey, it's been a while. Like you can kind of talk about the elephant in the room and call it out if you want. <laughs> Yeah, you can explain why or you cannot. Like, it's totally up to you. Or you can also just email them again, start emailing them and and not say it. Like, it's totally – there. I think it's partially – it ha depends on what your audience is, I would say. I think especially if you're kind of more in the, you know, B2C, the business to consumer space, it might make more sense to – share maybe why with it in a way that feels comfortable to you. And if you're in the B2B space, it might not make as much sense to do that. But again, it depends on your business and who you're serving. Um, and I think we've all been there where we've gotten an email out of the blue from someone we, ha we may have even forgotten about. And sometimes you go either, oh yeah, I remember that person. I'm excited to see them again. Or who the heck is this? I don't remember signing up for your list. I'm going to unsubscribe. And that's fine too, because I do think it is important to make sure our lists are clean. And and while I personally think there's value in everyone on your list, whether or not they ever buy from you or hire you, I do also at the same time believe it's really important to keep our lists clean because we don't want people on our list who just never engage at all with our emails because that just ends up harming our own deliverability of our emails. And we do want to make sure that people that who do want to hear from us get those emails. And when you say clean, you mean the people on your list are actually opening your emails, right? Yeah. So I, so I just did this workshop, but it was called a cold subscriber re-engagement campaign, which to me just sounds kind of like the like cold subscriber. Like these are people, they're not like, they're not like cold. They're just, you know, for whatever reason, they're not engaging. So, um, I, th I think your most email marketing platforms give you the ability to identify what, what they call cold subscribers. So they may define it slightly differently, but it's just people who haven't opened your emails in a certain span of time. And you can, I mean, some people just choose to flat out remove those people. I personally like to send a more targeted email to those people and say, Hey, I know I noticed it's been a while. And because I talk about email marketing and marketing and automation, I also call it out for what it is. I'm like this, just so you know, you're getting a cold subscriber re-engagement email. And then I kind of mock the term because again, it just sounds <laughs> so like, Bleh. but you know, and I explain why I'm doing it. And I, and then I offer up, if you'd like to stay on here, you know, here's, some information, like here's a three or two or three links that might be of interest or help to you. If you're interested, if you click on one of them, you'll stay on my list. If you've decided, you know, I don't want to, it's not a good fit. I don't want to hear from you anymore, Beth. You're welcome. You can hit un unsubscribe and I, that's totally cool. Um, so I like to go more that route in a way that feels good to you in terms of how you want to approach it. And like, you want to just be like one email. Hey, it's been a while. Got to click on a link if you want to stay here or it's bye. Or if you want to like have more, make it more of a conversation. Sure. And the benefits, I feel like the one benefit to cleaning your list is if you lose some subscribers, you can potentially save yourself some money, right? Exactly. Because when it comes yes. to a lot of these platforms, you pay per subscriber, kind of, right? Like they're like, tears but yeah exactly the more subscribers you have the more you're paying so if you mm -hmm. ensure that they're only the most relevant subscribers you could be saving yourself money yeah and i've definitely done that when i've noticed like oh i'm hitting that threshold where i'm getting to the the next tier it's that was a really good time to do a, to clean up my list and so you can go either way you can wait 
you know, choose to wait until you're about to hit that next payment tier, or you can just do it like on a calendar regularly because, you know, there's the monetary, exp- you know, the way you're hit monetarily if you have people who aren't opening your emails, but then you also have like, if you're, especially if you're a metrics person, like how it impacts, like how many people open and how many people click on your, your emails. And I don't know all the, like, I get a little confused with like email deliverability, but I think that that impacts it too, right? Like if your emails Mm -hmm. from your email address are like bouncing and not being opened, like someone out there in the email world, like will flag that your, your emails aren't good, right? Yeah, that's how I understand it. And I, I know that a lot of platforms talk about it. From my understanding, and I say this as someone who doesn't know how how Gmail and and Outlook and all of them run in the back, how they decide on things. But from my understanding, if, if you have a bunch of people with Gmail addresses and like 80% of them aren't opening it, Gmail is going to say, oh, this person must be spam. And then you could end up in the spam folder of people who do want to read your email. Right. So another reason why cleaning your list is a good business decision. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I know I have a client who uses ConvertKit. So I know like for most, like if you're already on a platform, you could Google like ConvertKit cleaning list and there'll be like a step by step. And if you're using something oh, else, yeah. active campaign, clean list and look for something mm-hmm. in their help documents. And they typically will just walk you through that process if anybody has questions on that. Yeah. Now, for the the super newbies who maybe are like, oh, shoot, I need to use something other than Gmail to email my list. What are your recommendations? I know you love ConvertKit, um, so feel (laughs) free. We touched a little bit on on why you stayed with ConvertKit, but what are some things that people should look for um, in a platform if they're they're starting from scratch? Yeah. So for one thing, I would look to see what other platforms you're currently using. because you want to choose a platform that's going to integrate easily with as many of those other things as possible. So for example, certain schedulers integrate better with certain email marketing platforms. So if you have a scheduler you love and you don't want to change it and you don't and you want to simplify it as much as possible, then check to see which plat- which email marketing platforms integrates um, natively with it, meaning you don't need to use a third another platform such as Zapier to have to connect the two. So that would be my, my biggest thing. And then it can be difficult at the beginning to know if later on in the, down the line, you're going to want to set up automations. But if you are like, you know what, I'm just never going to do that. I like sitting down on my computer once a week to write a live email to everyone on my list. Then you don't necessarily need as a robust platform as ConvertKit. Like there's some really great platforms that allow you to do really beautiful emails. Like I know Flowdesk is a very popular one and they like if if aesthetics are like your thing and you just want to do live, I don't know enough about Flowdesk, but what I do know is they make they have very beautiful emails. So if that if that's like, you know, that's the most important thing to me, then like that that can help you figure out your platform as well. So it's what's really important to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's part of it. Yeah, what's important to you if, you know, if you're trying to make sure they line up with your values, then check out what their values are. Mm-hmm. I mean, also it is important, you know, especially at the beginning you might want to consider cost, but in the long run, the co- especially when you're starting out and your list is small, your email marketing platform is actually not going to it's going to be such a small percentage of your overall cost of running your business. It's almost not not that it's not worth it because every penny counts, especially at the beginning, but like it's that's not going to be the thing that makes or breaks your business in terms of cost. Right. They're all very similar. Like all of yeah. they start at similar rates. It's really I feel like it's the bells and whistles that that differs the most. Yeah. But there is that element. Like you've got to weigh, I think, with any platform, you have to weigh like where you want to be in the next one to five years because moving things over is a lot of work. So I think Mm -hmm. there is that element of, for me, having done all that, like I'd rather make an investment, a reasonable investment, right? Like I'm not talking huge here, but 
yeah. um, knowing that it'll give me room to grow into. Exactly. And yeah, you bring up the point, is is this a platform I can grow into or is it really limited that it serves my purposes right now, but might not in a few years as my business grows? Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know, I'm going to call it out. MailChimp is like what everybody, everybody in air quotes uses in the beginning. But, and I know that they have some bells and whistles, but like ultimately everyone leaves to go to a different platform because you know, reasons, because there are different automations, different integrations, um, more, more bells and whistles with active campaign or convert kit, or FG mm-hmm. funnels or whatever the case may be. So not falling into that trap of MailChimp and MailerLite are really good for, you know, beginners, but they're not necessarily the platforms that are going to grow with you. Mm-hmm. Sorry, 100%. MailChimp and MailerLite. <laughs> They're not going to be sponsoring this episode. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I would love, first of all, I know you have a freebie that you've put together for us, right? I do. Although it's funny because I'm in the, it, it'll still be there, but I am in the process of changing it. But I do have, um, yeah, I do have like a free guide that kind of walks you through how to ensure that your opt-in is set up well. It is very, it is very ConvertKit specific, but a lot of the the themes of it, the ideas around it, can be applied to other email marketing platforms. So it's all it's a, called the ConvertKit opt-in optimizer. Awesome! So if you're using ConvertKit or you're thinking about using ConvertKit, you 100% want to get this opt-in. Um, and if you're not using ConvertKit, you still probably want to just grab it because it's free right? Why not? Go through it. I'm sure a lot of the themes of making sure, you know, are going to translate to other platforms to some of the buttons, you know, might be different, but it's still the same general premise. Exactly. And there's, and there are things that are pretty common, like you said, across platforms. So while the tech part of it, like won't match up, it is something that you could, that you may be doing that you're like, oh shoot, I want to change that. And where can our viewers and listeners connect with you? What are the best places on um, the internet? Yeah, so you can find me on my website, which is yourpersonaltechfairy.com. And in terms of social media, I'm also fairly active on Instagram, which is at your.personaltechfairy. And I love talking to people um, in the DMs and in not in a non-salesy, like, let's get to know each other way. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push a sale on you. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll put those links all in the show notes as well. And the link for the opt-in too will be in the show notes. And I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us today. I love connecting with other like-minded, busy, overwhelmed parent entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> and you fit that, you fit that box. We've had a lot of great yeah. conversations around that. So I encourage thank everyone you. listening to connect with Bev. Um, and get your email under control. All right, that is it for this episode of Familypreneur. Join us inside of the Familypreneur Business Accelerator to follow through on the action steps from this episode alongside an incredibly supportive community. Plus, access our robust training vault and a variety of exclusive monthly virtual events, including co-working, happy hours, and bonus training sessions head over to familypreneur.co and join us today. Until next time, I'll see you over in the Familypreneur Business Accelerator. Bye for now.